Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 5 and verse 10. Okay, so... As I say, this is not a book that we turn to particularly frequently. And it's not that surprising, really. It's not the easiest book to get your head around. It has some things that are quite tricky to understand, actually. But it also contains some of the most wonderful and glorious teaching in the whole of the New Testament. It goes into quite some depth over certain things. But it portrays Jesus perhaps in a way uniquely portrayed uh, in the New Testament. Um, So we're just going to spend a little bit of time. Why are we doing that? Because, as you'll see from uh, Prayer 90 this week, that um, our verse for Prayer 90, our focal verse for the week, is Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So I want to look at it in its context and uh, to just share some, some thoughts around that and to look at it as a, uh, a, 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 as a wonderful passage and promise to us uh, to give us great hope as we come to prayer throughout this week. So Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14 through to chapter 5 and verse 10. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honour upon himself. He must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. For what he suffered and once made, uh, uh, sorry, obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, I don't blame you if you're kind of looking at that passage saying, what on earth have we just read? Um, Because there are some strange things in there, uh, even for some of us who are, are seasoned readers of scripture, uh, there are some bits and pieces in there that may not make a lot of sense. And let me explain why I think it probably doesn't make too much sense to many of us, unlike other bits of the New Testament. Um, Firstly, to say that um, we're not actually sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, The best guess is probably Paul, but he never identifies himself. And if you've ever read Paul's letters, you'll see that this one seems to be very different in its tone to almost every other letter that we know or that is attributed to Paul. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's been so much doubt uh, in people's minds as to who was the author. And for many years, I kind of went along the line of, 
It may be Paul, but I very much doubt it for that reason. And it's in more recent times that I've come to think actually Paul is quite likely to be the author. So then how do I explain the departure in the style and the, the kind of teaching from the rest of his letters to this one? And, and here's my answer to that, is that because this time he's writing to a very different group of people. Most of his other letters are directed at a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. And so he speaks primarily to a Gentile people, a non-Jewish readership. The book of Hebrews, as the name suggests, is written to Hebrews or Jewish people. These were not Jews who were still in Judaism, but these were Jews who had met with Jesus. They had come out of the old Jewish faith and into a new messianic faith, trusting in Jesus as their Messiah. And Paul is writing to them. And I think that explains why he goes much heavier and deeper than perhaps he does in some of his other. I mean, some of his other stuff can be quite weighty. Even Peter admitted that in his letter and said some of Paul's teachings can be quite, you know, they can be quite weighty and in-depth. Um, but here in particular, he takes some very Jewish arguments. And so I don't blame you for looking at this passage and, frankly, almost any other bit of the book of Hebrews and saying, I find this too difficult. And it's because it is not uh, anywhere close to our culture. Now, it is true to say that even when you look at some of the rest of Paul's writings that were written predominantly to Gentiles, that's not our culture either. That was writing to uh, people who, in a Greco-Roman world, and they were heavily influenced by uh, the Greeks uh, as a foundation for their society. The society that we have today, of course, um, uh, here in the West, is also based on Greek culture. It's Greek foundations that we're based upon. And so it's much easier. We have a Greek minds, actually. Our, our thinking is, is trained in the Greek style of thinking uh, in the West. So, so you know, we think, actually, uh, and, and we can, we can uh, understand Paul's writing to the Greek world so much easier than we can to the Jewish world. I think it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons, why so much of the Old Testament for many people today is just off limits. They just look at it and say, I don't get it. I just don't get it at all. It makes no sense. But it is worth persevering with. I want to look at this in its context. Uh, so it is one particular verse, verse 16, that we want to focus on because that's our focal verse for the week for our, our prayers this week for Prayer 90. Um, so let me start, knowing what I'm like, um, let me start by dealing with verse 16, and uh, then the rest of the time uh, we can start to, to put it into its wider context um, and to see how it fits. Let's just remind ourselves again of, of the words of verse 16. Um, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, I want to try and simplify this and, and be as brief as I possibly can uh, with dealing with this. So we're, we're not uh, planning uh, to go uh, uh, you know, really deep into this this morning. I have to say that over the last week or so, as, as I've been looking at this coming up, uh, I've had a wonderful time just searching through the scriptures and it has taken me, I think, you know, almost from Genesis to Revelation, I think just going through the whole thing uh, as I, I, you know, I, I sew it all together. Uh, and it is fascinating um, to see it all. And so uh, I have to confess that I feel completely inadequate, however, because having even done that, I still feel that, uh, you know, I haven't got the full grasp uh, of everything that's being said. So don't expect too much this morning, I think, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but if we can just get a little bit of this uh, and the wonder of it, um, that, that will be sufficient. The Holy Spirit will open up our hearts and our minds to understand more. 
encourage you to meditate on it during the week. That's the purpose of it. And to look at it in its context. And, and may the Lord reveal more to you day by day. The very fact that Paul, or whoever, writing the book of Hebrews, says in verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace, or therefore let us approach the throne of grace. Whenever we see that word, therefore or then, it means that we have to take note of what came before. That's why we're looking at it in context. And so just very briefly to say to you that the whole of uh, the book of Hebrews up to this point, and indeed continues as well, uh, with th this, this kind of theme here, that what the writer is doing is he's taking all of the revered characters in the history of the Jews, and he's saying these are wonderful characters, but Jesus is greater. And he starts with angels, and he shows that the angels are incredible beings. We don't understand much about angels, but he says they're wonderful beings, and uh, the Jews perhaps had a much better grasp of angelic beings than we do today. But wherever you see angels appearing in their various forms, um, and whether it's angels appearing to, say, Mary with the announcement of the birth, um, or the seraphs and uh, what have you uh, up in, in uh, God's presence worshipping him at the throne. Whatever it might be and wherever you see them, they are glorious beings. In fact, they are so intimidating beings that usually when an angel appears to a human being, you notice the first thing that it records the angel says is don't be afraid. So that kind of says, doesn't it, that the state that the human being is in when they realize that they've actually got an angelic being, a messenger from God, standing in front of them. Do not be afraid. Now, there are good reasons to be afraid when angelic beings appear because they not only wield the message of God, but they also have his power and authority as he lends it to them. And God is a... Uh, in its truest and correctest for, uh, form of the word, is a terrible God. That doesn't mean he's, he's a bad God, but it means that he is one from whom we should tremble and be afraid. When we stand before God today, we treat him so flippantly. But if we really understood God, if we understood anything about who he is and what he's like, we should be very, very afraid of God. And yet, this verse will tell us otherwise. And we want to look at that and find out why. But angels, uh, he says, however, no matter how great angels might be, he says, the Son of God is even greater. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, says chapter 1 and verse 5. He says God didn't say that to angels. He never elevated them to the level of being his son. And yet he has one who he says, you are my son in Jesus Christ. And he goes on and you'll find that he shows us that that no matter uh, who you take from the history of Israel, all the great characters, Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than Abraham. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than even the original high priest himself, Aaron. And when we come into chapter 4, he now takes Jesus and he elevates him to a new level because he says if Jesus is that the Son is greater than all of these revered characters in the history of Israel, then let me tell you this. It's not that there is no room left for Jesus. But he says, I want to show you that he is not just the high priest 
In fact, he describes him as not a high priest in Aaron's line at all. He says he's a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm sure you all know who Melchizedek is, that common character who you hardly ever see. I mean, he only appears for a fleeting moment in Scripture back in Genesis. And this is the, you know, very briefly the story of Melchizedek. Melchizedek uh, lived at the time of Abraham, and Abraham came along, and uh, Melchizedek was an interesting character because he was both a king and a priest. He was king of a city, an ancient city called Salem. You might know it better today as Jerusalem. He was king of Jerusalem. And Salem uh, is the root word from which the Jews get their word shalom, which means, of course, peace. And so he was the king of a city called Peace. You'd never believe that of Jerusalem today, would you? But that's what God's promise is for Jerusalem. He said he was king of peace, but he was also priest of God Most High. So great, he says, was this king and priest that Abraham, who went into battle, defeated his enemies, and he came and he took a tenth of all the plunder, a tithe, from which it's part of the reason that, that we, we talk about tithing, and lots of people tithe their, their money today. But he took a tenth of all that he had, and he brought it, and he gave it to this king, Melchizedek, as an offering. Now the argument is this, that if Abraham, who is considered the father of the Jews, is so great, how come he gave his offering to this man Melchizedek. And we know nothing more about Melchizedek. In fact, Hebrews goes on to tell us that Melchizedek had no beginning, he had no end. That doesn't mean he's eternal. What it means is in the accounts of Melchizedek, we don't know where he came from. It tells us nothing about his, his ancestry. It tells us nothing about his descendants. So it's almost like he just appears with no mother and father and no children. He's just there. And so he's, in a sense, in that way, forever. Aaron was not a priest forever. All the priests that followed him and the high priests were not priests forever. They were priests for a short time. And then came the time for them to retire from that. And they had to give up their duties. A priest could only serve for 30 years. And then their time was up. But this priest, Melchizedek, he seems to have been an eternal priest. And therefore Jesus is a priest, not in the order of Aaron, not one of his descendants, but from this mysterious king priest. And Jesus also becomes, for us, the king and priest. And we can have profit to that as well, but that's another thing altogether. But he says you know, Jesus is special. He's much greater than even Aaron was. Therefore, keeping this in mind, keeping that we have now what he describes here as not the high priest, even a special high priest, but the great high priest. And Jesus is given the title great on a number of occasions. He is the great shepherd of the sheep, for example. He's not just the good shepherd or the shepherd, but the great shepherd. And Jesus is not just the priest or the high priest, but he is the great high priest, which means that he is above all others. And as the great high priest, he performs his duties in a way that no other high priest before him has ever been able to perform their duties. So getting back to verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us 
in our time of need. I need to talk to you a little bit about the rituals that the Jews went through and the high priest in approaching the throne of God. I don't know what you understand about the temple and temple worship. It is incredibly complicated, um, and I'm going to try not to, uh, you know, complicate it unnecessarily. If you're really interested in that, go, go back into Leviticus, I think it's about 16, and you'll find there that uh, it tells you all about what happened on the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement was once a year. Um, uh, there is still a Day of Atonement today. It's Yom Kippur. Uh, but on the, the Day of Atonement, the priest had to go into a very special part of the temple. Now, he and he alone, as the high priest, was allowed to go into this special room. He was only allowed to go in there once a year, and that was it. He was not allowed to spend a long time in there. He had to get his duties done, and then he had to come out. And it was a fearful place to be. Uh, in fact, there was even thoughts about what happens in a contingency plan. What happens if God does not accept the atonement that is being made? We'll talk about what atonement is in a moment. Um, so what they did was they, they tied a rope uh, around the high priest's ankle. And uh, when he went into the Holy of Holies, uh, into the center of the temple, through the curtain that was dividing it, he had this rope that was uh, connected to the outside. And uh, if he didn't come out, uh, they could haul him out um, because they didn't dare go in there themselves. Let's just hope the rope doesn't snap. That's all I can say, but, um, or come undone. Uh, but, you know, they took this really seriously. Um, but once a year, there was a sacrifice that was made for the sins of the people. And it had to be brought to God. Now, the sacrifice was, was um, I mean, there were rituals about that as well. And what they would do is they would make the sacrifice upon the altar and they would catch the blood of the sacrifice. It's a bit gory, um, but, you know, they, they catch the blood of the sacrifice and they would put that into a bowl. Then they would take the carcass of the sacrifice outside of the camp or the city where it would be burned and disposed of. And then they would take the blood or the high priest would take the blood in a bowl and he would take that right into the Holy of Holies and he would pour it on top of an item that was in there called the mercy seat. And in that way, they were trying to atone, to make good for the sins of the people for the whole year. But it only atoned for a year. In fact, actually, if we want to be really picky about this, it didn't atone for anything at all. But that was the idea, was they had to go back every year, spill the blood again, all over this thing, this object, in the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat. Underneath the mercy seat was the law of God. The Ark of the Covenant was there. On top of the ark, the box with the law in it, was this gold-covered mercy seat. At each end, there were golden angels that had been crafted to look down over the mercy seat. And in the center burned the fire of God, the Shekinah glory. The God who had come with them out of Egypt through the desert. And finally he rested there and sat on the mercy seat. A throne in other words. That's what we mean by the seat. It was a throne where God had his feet. Heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool, the Psalms tells us. And here he was, his presence was there manifest in this burning fire that was inside. 
must have been quite an incredible sight that only the priest ever got to see, the high priest ever got to see. And we can see the parallel between uh, that atonement sacrifice that was being made and the sacrifice that Jesus made because Jesus himself was also sacrificed, not so much on an altar but on a cross. And where he was taken outside of the city, not inside, but on the outside. There he hung and he died. But what did he do with his blood? Oh, yes, I know it poured out on the ground, his, his, his blood. But in another sense, Jesus did something really quite remarkable. And the high priests in their rituals not realizing what they were doing, were acting out what Jesus himself would one day do. They were foretelling, if you like, they were prophetic in this way, of showing what they would do. Let me explain how this works. As the priest comes with the blood, he has to go through several places, several courts, to get to the holy place. The sacrifice was done outside of the temple or outside of the, the courts. And then he would take the, the blood and he would walk, first of all, through the outer court, the court of the men. Then he would walk into the inner court, the court of the priests. And finally, he would then go through the curtain and into the most holy place that we've already talked about, before he could offer the blood. But Jesus, our great high priest, went, the word says, through the heavens with the blood. Now, for the Jews at this time, I know that if you, if you want to look up uh, the heavens today and look at it, you'll find the seven heavens but for the Jews at this time, there were three heavens. There was the immediate sky around us, where the birds flutter around. There was that level of the heavens, one that we could almost touch. But then there was the stellar heaven, where the stars are. And that was much further away, beyond our immediate atmosphere. And then, of course, there was the heaven where God dwells. And Jesus ascended from the earth upwards through the first heaven, through the second heaven, into the third heaven. And there he comes to make that atonement to approach the throne of God, a mercy seat that is in that third heaven. And everything the Jews have been doing and the priests have been doing all those years was playing out what Jesus was doing at his ascension. But there was one big difference this time. When Jesus went through the heavens and finally got to the throne and came before the throne with his offering of blood that he had given up, for he himself was the perfect sacrifice. But when he got into that third heaven, he did something very different to what the priests on earth did. You see, when you went into that little room, that holy of holies, and it was only, you know, about 30 feet by 30 feet, I think. Um, so, you know, sort of about, about the size of this room, I guess. But apart from right in the center, having the Ark of the Covenant with the gold uh, seat across the top and the angels either side bearing down upon it, the mercy seat. But apart from that, there were no other objects in the room. There were paintings on the wall, but, but there were no, no objects in the room. There was nowhere for the priest to sit down, for instance, if he got tired. Because the idea was not to spend long in the presence of God. It was too fearful. The idea was to get on, make this atonement for the people, and get out of there as quickly as possible. 
not to dilly-dally around. But Jesus was different. You see, when he went through the heavens and got back to the third heaven, back to the throne of God, it says that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Now look, there's only one reason that you sit down when you're doing the job, a job like this, and that's when you're finished, when it's complete, when it's over. The priest on earth didn't have time to sit down. Why? Because they had to get back out there and carry on ministering to the people. Their work was not over. The sins began to accumulate over the next year. And once again, they would have to make this atonement and take the blood back in and make the sacrifice um, and the atonement for the people all over again, year after year after year. But Jesus got back into heaven itself, to the throne, and says, I've done everything. The task is complete. And then he sits. And having had now our sins atoned for once and for all, no longer having to go through these rituals of animal sacrifice, because Jesus has become the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And having that assurance that now we no longer have to come uh, you know, wait for the priest to come out and say the slate has been wiped clean for another year, but then have to start calculating, my goodness, look at all these, these, these wrongdoings adding up again and again and again. This time, Jesus said, it's all right, I've done it. I've done it. The reason that this seat, this throne, if you like, in the middle of the temple is called the mercy seat is because it was hoped that God would act mercifully when the offering was made. And that indeed, uh, you know, part of the, the, the sacrifice or part of the, the ritual was using the scapegoat. Now you might well have heard of the term scapegoat. Um, but when it came to, to making the, uh, uh, the offerings and the sacrifices and the, all the rituals that went with it, there were two animals that came. Uh, one, a goat was sent out into the wild, bearing at least as a picture of, bearing the sins of the people and carried them far away. But Jesus doesn't need a scapegoat. Jesus said, I'm going to deal with it all. He doesn't need to send somebody off with our sins. He says, I bear the sins. I carry the sins. The sins are upon me. I've dealt with them once and for all. So we now come, not to an earthly temple, we come to a heavenly one. We come to Jesus Christ himself. He sits at the throne, the throne next to his Father in heaven. He managed to do what no other priest before him managed to do. He managed to achieve what no animal sacrificed before him managed to achieve. That your sins and my sins are forgiven, past, present, future. Every last one. He has completed the job. And so, verse 16 tells us that we can now come with confidence. That we approach with boldness before the throne. Interesting, actually, that this word... Here in verse 16, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence. Is a spoken confidence. It's not just a, a self-confidence deep inside us. Sometimes we talk, don't we, of a person being very confident or being self-confident, meaning that they seem to have a, a certain self-assuredness about them. No fear and they seem to be, you know, okay and mastering the, the situation. It's not like that. This is a boldness in speech. A boldness in speech. 
When the priest went into the temple, he offered up prayers for the people. You do not need a priest to go on your behalf to ask forgiveness for you. The way has been made open. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It was God who opened the way and said, no more do you need a priest to go on your behalf. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is also the priest, the great high priest, has gone before you. Just go to him. Just go to him. He's made the way open. He invites you to come to his throne where you find mercy and grace. And when do you find mercy and grace? In your time of need. And that's a very interesting uh, phrase here that it, uh, it, it, it puts across. I discovered that where it talks about our time of need or to find grace to help us in our time of need. I was looking through my, 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 my Greek Bible and I discovered this word for help only appears twice in the New Testament. Now, I know the word help appears many times in the New Testament, but this particular word that was used is only found twice. In the Old Testament, you'll find it a number of times. But the only other time that we actually find it is in the book of Acts and chapter 27. And there in Acts 27, we have the account of Paul on his way to Rome. He's been arrested, he's on a ship, and uh, the ship is sailing for Rome when they hit a storm. And the storm became uh, so severe, and it raged for day after day. And it was, it was a terrible, terrible time. Um, and they were doing all sorts of things that they could do. Um, so that, uh, that they, they could rescue the ship. They, they threw all the cargo overboard to make it lighter. And, and you know, I mean, they, they did all sorts of things. They, they were so fearful that the ship was not going to make it. In fact, it says in verse 17 that when the men had hoisted it aboard, um, it says, um, uh, and, and it's talking there about the anchor, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. And this word for ropes is exactly the same word for help that we find in Hebrews 4. It's the only two places in the whole of the New Testament where it appears. It's actually borrowing a maritime word for a rope. We would call it in English a frap. And they were frapping the ship. They were literally tying it together because it was about to fall apart. And as they, they put the rope around it, now, of course, we wouldn't need it today with uh, the kind of hulls that we build today. But when you got wooden ships, as they had, made of individual planks, there was a great danger that the strain and the stress caused by uh, the storm would literally cause the ship to break apart. So to try and hold it, they, they tried to secure it with these ropes, going all around the ship, tie it together. That was the help they had. And here is the image, it's a wonderful image for us, that at the time when we ourselves are about to be shipwrecked, when we ourselves are about to fall apart because we cannot cope and do anything for ourselves, that we come to him, to Jesus Christ, who in effect ties the rope around us, or the chain, sometimes they use chains for it, to tie us together, to hold us together, so that we do not break apart and sink, so that we are not lost forever, that he rescues us in this way. I don't know if you ever fe felt like that, but there are times when sometimes in our lives that you know we go through some really bad occasions and it's just wonderful to look back and to see how Jesus held us together throughout life. That's the kind of thing that he does. But I want to take this whole thing a, a step further because I want us to consider that what the book of Hebrews is doing and not just this verse but in its wider context what it's doing is this and it's approaching some people, some Jews 
who had turned to Christ as their Messiah. And I think some of them were beginning to turn away from him. They were starting to go back to their old ways. Now, that was actually quite common of the Jews at that time. And very often they would lead others back into their old ways as well. Sometimes scripture describes them as Judaizers. They were the people who came along and said, you can't live in this particular way. You've got to live just as we Jews live. And there is time and again warnings uh, from Paul and others about the Judaizers. Don't be deceived by them. Don't go back into their old way of works. That's what it was about. The old rituals that they did, it was all about earning their salvation. It was works. And he said, we now live by the grace of God. We don't deserve to have his mercy. We deserve only his anger towards us. But he's holding us together with his ropes. Something we don't deserve. That we will not sink and be lost for all eternity. But in doing so, what the writer to Hebrews is encouraging is this. He's saying to the Jews, once you turned away from your old Jewish habits and you turned fully to Christ. Now you're turning away from Christ, but you're not going to go all the way back to your Jewish habits. We sometimes call that today backsliding. By that, what we mean is somebody who's become a follower of Jesus and then they kind of no longer, well, they are sort of following Jesus, but but not really. It's not active, so they've kind of turned away from him. They haven't quite gone back sometimes to the old, sometimes they do, but they haven't gone all the way back, but they're kind of halfway between the two. And as I read this and began to understand what the book of Hebrews is talking about, this is the thought that's going through my mind, is that I think this is so relevant for today, that there are many, many people who have turned away from what is wrong, turned away from sin, but they haven't turned to Christ. Lots of people in that situation. I hear that all the time. People who say to me, you know, I'm not a bad person. I didn't say you were a bad person. You chose to tell me you're not a bad person. What did I do? I encouraged them to turn to Christ. What they mean is this, that they don't rob banks, throw acid in people's faces, wield knives to do harm to people, innocent people. That's what they mean when they say they're not a bad person. But equally, they're not 100% following Christ either. They're kind of somewhere in the middle of the two. And the message of Hebrews is, that's not good enough. You see, the message of Christianity is not as it's often, I I think, mispresented about how to avoid hell, though that's part of the message. It's far more about how to enter the blessing of heaven. It's far more about how to to get the most out of Christ rather than just to avoid the danger. I mean, you have to look at both sides, of course. We would be wrong if we didn't tell you about both sides. But so many people have said, okay, I'll just do the things that I think will, will just clear me out of the out of the hell bracket when I die. That's not good enough. We need to be following Jesus fully, wholly. And the reason for that is that he is the great high priest who has paid an incredible price for you. Did he pay an incredible price for you? 
just so that you would become a morally good person. No, of course he didn't. Because actually you see that where we deceive ourselves is when we think that by just being a morally good person, that will be enough, then we're relying on what the Bible describes as works. It's our own effort. Surely God will be impressed by what I have done. God will be impressed that I don't carry a knife or a gun or etc. And you might say, my goodness, that, that seems pretty, you know, extreme. Surely God will be impressed with, with, you know, something more than that, though. Okay, so let's take it to the next level then. Not only do I not do those things, but, but God will be impressed that I actually help the poor people in the community. God will be impressed that I look out for those who are in need and see what I can do for them. God will be impressed that whenever there's an appeal made on TV that I text whatever number it is to the charity to give five pounds. Is God impressed by those things? Not one bit of it. Not one bit. Okay, let me take you to the next level. If God's not going to be impressed by that, let me then go to the local church and I'll polish the silver. God's got to be impressed with that, hasn't he? I mean, not only do I not carry weapons and do terrible things to people, in fact, I actually try and be positive and help them in their time of need, but I actually go to the church itself and polish the silver, or whatever it is that you do. Is God impressed? Not one bit of it. He's not swayed in the slightest by that. He says, do you think that my son, my one and only son, coming to this earth, living the perfect life, the life without sin, having experienced every temptation, That doesn't mean every individual temptation, but every category of temptation that you yourselves experience, but came through it faultless, and then went all the way to the cross and died the most cruel death you could possibly think of. That he actually went in his spirit down into the depths of hell itself, where he endured the agony of what that means, which we cannot possibly describe, and then came all the way back again, And now has made it up into the heavens. He's gone through the heavens into the very throne room of God. And there at the throne of mercy has said, here is my blood. I have poured out. And sat down with his finished work. He says, do you think I am impressed that you now try and usurp his power, his authority, his ability to save you and to try and save yourselves. Because God says, I'm not impressed one little bit. And that's actually the wonderful thing about Christianity is that you can do nothing to save yourself except to believe, to trust in Jesus. The things we've been talking about today that that. This is the way in which God is impressed. It's not with you, but it's with Jesus he's impressed. Do you trust Jesus? Was his blood shed for you? Does that mean that you can trust him and still throw acid in somebody's face? No, of course not. Does it mean you can trust him and just ignore the needs of the people around you? No, not at all. Does it mean that by trusting him, therefore, you don't need to serve him in any other way through his church? No, it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, these are the byproduct then of saying, but I have faith and I trust in Jesus. You see, it's the other way around. Suddenly, because I trust in him, because he's done so much for me, I want to serve him back. I want to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece here on earth. I want to do the things then not to impress him, but to show others the love of Christ too. And we've got to get it that way round.
All because we have a great high priest ourselves who has done everything for us once and for all, sat down, said it is finished. The work is done. And now you can enter into my rest. Now I'm tempted to go on to talk about the Sabbath here as we talk about rest. I'm going to resist. I'm going to have to do that for another time. Because that's another interesting thing. But just to say this, that when he talks in Hebrews then on about the Sabbath's rest, he's not talking about, as the Jews do, just take Saturday as a day of no work. But he says, no, no, he says, it's much more than that. It's all about saying, no longer do I strive to try and get my salvation. No longer do I work at it myself, thinking I'm doing myself a favor and pleasing God, but saying that I'm relying 100% on what Jesus has done for me. I just want to challenge you, just ask you today, when Jesus died on the cross, did he die for you? When his blood was made, the sacrifice, was it a sacrifice for you? In other words, do you know that simply for the asking, that's the bit that most people stumble on. Surely it's got to be more difficult than that, hasn't it? No, it hasn't. Just for the asking, he says, I'll forgive you. Turn to me, follow me. It's all you've got to do. And I'll guarantee the rest. What a wonderful, amazing Savior, great high priest we have in Jesus. Let's pray.